thank you so much and I'm really delighted and excited to be here and uh, I just want to first mention that my loving husband of 50 years is or past 50 years is sitting here and my our wonderful daughter so uh, until, until they, well obviously Russell had to make it but you know uh, I'm still thrilled to have loving members of my family when something so unique as this happens. So um, I think my mini talk will be a, a, a little different in the sense that I am slanting it from a women's position and a woman who was still part of a very different era when uh, what was expected of us was to have an engagement ring on our fingers by at least our junior year of college, uh, our third year, and to marry someone who could support us and have a family. I'm not saying that many women didn't go well beyond this, but in, 19, in the 1950s into 1960 when I graduated, women were not being encouraged uh, professionally as they are today. So I want to put this in perspective, of course, of my life. And um, how could I talk about the Norwalk school system and the Norwalk High School without mentioning my father, Dr. Harry Becker, who was superintendent of schools then. I lived in a very, very special time in the sense that um, uh, in one hand, I was very just a very ordinary young girl going to the high school. But on the other hand, I was listening to conversations at night or meetings or things that my parents were involved with that were opening up new worlds that have never, never been opened before, particularly grants that changed a lot of the aspects of classroom teaching in Norwalk in those days. Um, team teaching and all sorts of other creative modes which my father and many other people were behind and then the reality of public education for uh, two-year colleges the coming of age where everyone could go to an, uh, in Norwalk could get a two-year degree um, here in a legitimate very high-level two-year program at the Norwalk Community Col College. This was um, tremendous and it took a lot of law changing at the state level and all sorts of things. So on one hand, I was just the kid who had a crush, who got dropped by somebody or liked somebody or waited for the phone to ring because in those days, if you didn't have a date, by Wednesday night, you were a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was, and, and you know, it was awful. You know, then you had to wait till the next week. I can remember lying. In, I can remember lying in bed like I wanted to call this fellow so badly. I was imagining dialing his number, but I knew if he didn't call me, too bad. So on the other hand, I was being exposed to a brand new world where all sorts of things were going to happen in the next, as it turned out, 60 years, whatever. Um, I was living with parents where my father's destiny was to build someone up. No one ever left his office without feeling better. And no one could pass away, could talk to my father without being told you have a strength there's something interesting in your background. I know we can work on this, you know, whatever it was. And on the other hand, I had a mother who was a, a wonderful teacher herself of second and third grades and had a marvelous sense of humor that at times my father found a little over the top because he was very serious. But she lighted up my life and always gave me courage and conviction that today would be an even better day. So that's the way I started out. That was the world I was in. And um, 
as far as the uh, teachers themselves. Um, oh, I should also mention, I was not a, a star in the high school in the sense of being on a lot of committees. I did work on the newspaper. I worked on several things, but I wasn't out there. And um, because I was involved in my own head, I guess. I wrote poetry. I was interested in writing stories. I was very close to my girlfriends. They were really important to me. And um, I guess I didn't know how to be really a major player at that point. But there was one thing that I really did know, and that was I had a future. And no one could take that away from me. And that was the composition of both my family and Norwalk High. And I'll tell you about Norwalk High. The teachers were excellent. They were very, very fair, and they were well trained. I wish I could tell you I remember everyone's name, but we just moved. I don't know where my yearbook is, and I, I don't remember all the teachers' names. But I never had a teacher that was unfair, who was prejudiced or biased in any way. They were always helpful, and we learned a lot, really a lot. The physics teacher taught us an unbelievable amount, the history teacher, the French teacher, you know, every teacher, the English teachers. And um, I respect and, and appreciate what they were able to give us. Um, it was, um, let me just check this for a second. Um, I'm uh, talking about myself a little bit because um, one type of example of, of the women of my time, then and still now, I needed to be encouraged. I was in the higher class track, whatever it was called in that day, and it was hard, but the teachers were encouraging and I was glad I was in that level. But my husband was sitting back there was in Pittsburgh and he was taking advanced placement classes. We didn't have any in our district, maybe very soon after, but not that then. It was really very good for me that we didn't have advanced place uh, work because when I was a little girl, I still couldn't read in the, in the third grade. I had disabilities. And if any of you have had disabilities, you may remember that they were not cared for in our generation. You know, you might have a good teacher who gave you some suggestions, but there was no opportunity to really correct a disability. And when I hadn't learned to read by the third grade, I did have a good teacher who said, here's what you have to do, Barbara, and you'll learn to read. Memorize every word and, me and don't look back. And that's what I did. I still can't sound out a word. Don't test me, you'll laugh. <laughs> so, um, but it was okay because by not being pushed beyond my limits, I could really flower. And I'll tell you a, just one funny story. I thought the boys in our top classes were so smart. And I'm, they were, many of them did very distinguished things. The girls were more meek. It were, again, it was a time where the girls didn't you know, constantly raise their hands and do the extra project and whatever. And uh, so I thought these boys were great. So I figured, I'd like to join the chess club because they're all there, they're all so bright, they go to this chess club. And uh, of course they didn't know what to do with me because I was the only girl. They said, you wanna be secretary? <laughs> okay, I'll be secretary. I don't know what I was supposed to do, but okay. Eventually, they tried to teach me chess. I could not learn. <laughs> so eventually, I had to quit and let somebody else be the girl in the chess club. But it just, you know, just one of the funny stories that, that stayed with me. And so when I got to be um, working after my doctorate, there were two big aha moments that came to me that still control my academic life and my personal life to some, some extent. 
One was that I saw there was a big mistake in the way we handle mental care in our country, mental health care. And that mistake is held by psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, everybody who's involved to some extent. And that is that we look for the problems and mistakes and handicaps that our patients have rather than their talents, their strengths, and their motivation and their human potential. Once I discovered that, it was alive in me. And I finally, I not only interviewed women who weren't in my practice, but I wrote a book, I did all sorts of other things. And I believe to this day, if you can help someone from the sunny side up before you go to the more distressing <coughs> things, you're going to have more of a win-win. And so that I call the enchanted self. And I mentioned that self word because it came up again 10 years ago and it's still active with me. The sense of self that um, modern day techn technology has allowed with the phones that we have is an absolute miracle, although I don't think people fully understand or appreciate it. The sense of self that it gives people to record their own lives, to interview others, to make a funny film of your whatever, it could be your cat playing the piano, but you know, it's personal and it's historical for you. And the capacity to better see yourself, even take your own picture. You don't have to wait. Once I became 50, no one ever wanted to take my picture. You know, even my grandkids, take me, take me, you know, they're all posing. <laughs> Nobody said, sit down, I want your picture. But, and it, you know, who cares? You can take your own picture. You can do anything you want to make your own history with the types of technology that currently exist. And so I started to make a lot of short films to help kids with coming of age. And I'm still doing a lot of that, plus some uh, films for adults too, with the sense of self. Self never leaves us. And when we fall off our horse, we have to get back on. And the more we understand our own talents and, and, and ourselves, we'll get on, we'll get on better. And that's about it, so um, I'm thrilled. I, I'm, I don't know who put my name in, but thank you, it's wonderful. <laughs> and um, I wish everybody here a lot of blessings, a great year, feeling well, and that's it.